Yes. Professor Lowe, we're going to dot around from topic to topic now because a number of the questions that I'm going to ask are dis questions on discrete issues that have been raised by core participants uh, through their legal representatives. Um, could we start, please, with uh, a document on screen, HCDO 40278-109. underscore Please show me. This was a letter written um, by you um, in October 1996 to Dr. Ludlam. And if we just look at the first main paragraph, um, you say it's entitled Exclusion of Employees of Manufacturers of Treatment for Haemophilia from Delivery of Haemophilia Care. As you know, I raised this question at the last UK HCDO Regional Representatives Meeting on the 16th of September 1996. The reason was the recent decision by our trust to involve employees of SNBTS, which currently manufactures several products for treatment of haemophilia, in blood transfusion within the trust, which might potentially involve them in delivery of haemophilia care. I suggested that this possibility must be expressly forbidden by UK health departments because it is a clear conflict of interest. An employee of one manufacturer of products for haemophilia treatment is clearly liable to choose their employer's products over those of another manufacturer. It's therefore as much a conflict of interest for such employees to be involved in haemophilia care as it would be for employees of pharmaceutical companies to have any involvement in a healthcare provider's pharmacy services. Um, could, can you uh, assist Professor Lowe with what, what, what your concern was and what the outcome was of the issue that you'd raised? Uh, yes, I can, and uh, I think it's in uh, my written statement at 114, and the situation was that um, uh, Dr. Ian Franklin, whom, uh, who's given evidence to you, who worked in Birmingham, he was appointed the bone marrow transplant director in the Glasgow Rod Infirmary, um, and then in 1996, the time of this uh, issue, uh, he was appointed uh, as regional director of the West of Scotland Blood Transfusion Service, and at the same time he was given a university uh, app um, appointment as professor of transfusion medicine in the Department of Medicine uh, in which I worked, and he had a senior lecturer. Um, and so they became my research and teaching colleagues, so obviously I got to know uh, Dr. Franklin uh, very well. Um, and he recognized that in 1996, um, Dr. Walker and I um, had been including Dr. John Davidson, um, who ran the uh, blood bank. The three of us had done a kind of uh, one in three cover of the hemophilia uh, service. Uh, Dr. Davidson in particular, um, covering for us when Dr. Walker and I were attending meetings, etc. Uh, now, Dr. Davidson became ill at that time and uh, was off and off on sick leave uh, for the next couple of years. And at this time, uh, Professor Franklin kindly offered to participate in, in cover of uh, the haemophilia uh, unit because he'd had previous experience uh, in Birmingham. Um, so Dr. Walker and I were uh, very much appreciated his kind offer but we were aware that in some English centres as well, it was being mooted that some um, providers of blood products uh, were also keen to get involved in haemophilia care. And therefore, um, my concern, and also some colleagues in England, uh, was, as you see in, in the letter, it's potentially a conflict of interest to uh, people who have involvement in... Um, uh, haemophilia treatments and their production, which, which he was, uh, to may be in a, ever in a position that he would be choosing what products to, to use. So uh, Dr. Walker and I, and indeed Dr. Davidson, discussed with um, uh, Professor McKillop, my boss, and Dr. Davidson was the head of haematology, and we agreed that um, to avoid any potential conflict of interest, uh, we politely declined uh, Dr. Franklin's uh, uh, kind offer, and he and his colleague, in fact, uh, continued 
very impressive clinical research activities in the quite separate field of bone marrow uh, transplantation. Could, could I just add that um, in addition to what I said in my uh, statement of 30th September, I was listening, of course, to uh, Professor Franklin uh, talking to you a few weeks ago, and um, I noted in his uh, statement um, that he had, uh, uh, from the, sorry, from his written statement to the inquiry, he had stated, in Glasgow I had only one job, running the BMT unit with some general haematology work. Because I had haemophilic experience, I occasionally, meaning rarely, provided consultant oversight at weekends or out of hours to enable my consultant colleagues with an interest in haemophilia to attend meetings. I had no control or say over what products was used. And having read that, I sent you a brief supplementary statement saying, I agree with Professor Franklin. It was a very kind uh, offer, explained the situation, and confirm that uh, Professor Franklin occasionally, meaning rarely, provided cover of the Haemophilia Centre in Dr. Davidson's absence, and I agree that he had no control or say over what products were, were used. So, so there was no problem from our point of view. So leaving aside the position of, of, of Dr. Franklin or any particular individual, the concern as a matter of principle was that a, an SMBTS employee should, just as with a pharmaceutical company employee, not have involvement in decisions relating to haemophilia care because of the possibility of conflict of interest. That, that is correct. Um, then um, an, another document now on a different topic, ARCH 30-3312 underscore 020, please. So this is a document we looked at with Professor Ludlam last week, Professor Lowe, and I just want to ask for your input, please. We can see it's a note of a meeting, 10th of February 2000, to discuss the information required to assist, assist in the examination of circumstances surrounding the safety of SMBTS blood products from hepatitis C. And we can see that you were in attendance. Uh, we can see also from paragraph one, um, there was an outline of the minister's meeting with the Haemophilia Society, the minister's undertaking to examine the circumstances surrounding the safety of SNBTS products from hepatitis C, with particular reference to the society's claim that Scottish patients were exposed to hepatitis C longer than patients in England were. So that was the, the context of the meeting. If we then go on to the fourth page of the document, please, Shane Mick, paragraph nine. We can see here um, that you are raising the question of whether it's necessary to contact patients to make um, them aware. That there's a response which is, um, it should be borne in mind the information might be, might be used in future court actions. Professor Ludlam um, um, sought advice on whether there should be uh, attempts by haemophilia directors to try and identify um, patients whose whereabouts and status were unknown. Uh, and then um, uh, Mrs. Towers uh, says uh, you should follow central legal office advice. Um, do, do you have any um, reflection, Professor Lowe, on what it was that led you to raise this question? Um, and um, uh, can you recall what you thought of the response, um, which appears to be, to be uh, seeking to deter you and Professor Ludlam from undertaking the exercise they contemplated. Okay, so uh, the point I raised first, um, um, because um, at this period of time, uh, the um, directors of the Haemophilia Center uh, were uh, Professor Forbes and Dr. McDonald, and I, I thought at least you know, while as current directors, I was, uh, I and my colleagues were very happy to help, but I wondered if um, uh, they should uh, be involved in helping to assess uh, information about it. That was a simple inquiry. As regards Mrs. Towers' um, thoughts, um, I didn't think it was relevant 
that this could result in future court uh, actions. I just thought it would be courtesy to inform our predecessors. And I don't quite understand Mrs. Towers's uh, point that haemophilia directors should follow CLO advice on whether further investigation was necessary. I, 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 I think it's irrelevant. I think that we were all uh, accepted that the patients requesting this inquiry had a very valid case, and we should be uh, investigating the patients and the, and the batches as, as a matter of course, regardless of any, I don't think we have, we ever took CLO advice. I think we just got on with the investigation to establish the facts. Okay. So as far as you're concerned at the Glasgow Royal Infirmary, did you do what Professor Ludlam is here quest asking about? Did you undertake a look back at the Royal Infirmary to try and identify um, uh, patients who's, who had not hitherto been contacted and tested? Yeah, I think the, the process that we used, which was coordinated by Dr. Cahia, who was the uh, secretary to the uh, Scottish um, Haemophilia directors, was that we would collectively do all we could uh, to identify which patients had been uh, treated with this product at that period of time. I think we recommended that we should contact UK HCDO database uh, in addition to our own uh, notes. And I think we spent a lot of time trying to identify what patients were treated with what product at that time um, and to help with identification of um, um, uh, uh, episodes of hepatitis. Okay. Do, do you know, do, if you don't please say so, do you know how many patients of the Glasgow Royal Infirmary were identified as a result of this exercise? and how many may have subsequently been identified later? I, I think we discussed this briefly yesterday, Ms. Richards. I think from my memory, we had two patients uh, treated in this time uh, period. I think one with cryoprecipitate and one with the um, SNBTS concentrate at, at the time. Um, I think my, my impression was the minister and the Scottish executive were very keen to, to get a quick answer. So I think we did what we could in the time permitted, and then you'll have seen the report of the inquiry. Uh, regarding subsequent investigations, um, it may have been our successor, uh, Dr. Tate, um, uh, possibly on, on behalf of the Penrose inquiry, may have uh, got further information, but I don't know. Um, next document, HCDO 30271 underscore 014, please show me. There may be a missing zero there. Um, try four zeros, HCDO 40271 underscore 014. go to the second page. So this is the, s the minutes of the same meeting we looked at earlier, Professor Lowe. We looked previously at, at the, uh, the discussion about testing for hepatitis C and patient consent. I want to look at this now for a further um, purpose. So we can see it's a meeting of the AIDS group of haemophilia centre directors. Can you just assist us first of all with this? What was the purpose and function of the AIDS group? So I recall the AIDS group was set up by my predecessor, Dr. Forbes, in January of 1985, specifically to hold regular meetings uh, to address the issues emerging about AIDS in uh, haemophilia. And then um, I succeeded Dr. Forbes as a member of this. And uh, by this time, as you can see, it's pretty well every uh, major um, haemophilia centre uh, is represented at that time, and I represented uh, Glasgow Royal Infirmary. And would it be fair to, to say that the purpose of the AIDS group, or at least a main purpose of it, would have been to try and ensure the best possible um, care and decisions taken in, in relation to patients who had been infected with uh, uh, HIV in consequence of their treatment? Yes. 
Now, if we look further down this letter, we can see um, that uh, in paragraph 1b, the chairman welcomed Dr. Simpson, joint secretary of the three defence unions. And then we can see there's a prolonged discussion which starts at the bottom of this page under the heading litigation. Dr. Savage raised the point that one member of the AIDS group was, let me go to the next page, Acting as an expert on behalf of the plaintiffs, wondered whether it was acceptable for him to take part in the group's discussions on litigation and the defence of the main statement of claim. Dr Simpson said this was an awkward position. It would be less awkward if the expert was advising on the generic action. Dr Aronstam said he was the person referred to. He'd not been asked to be a medical expert witness for the plaintiffs. If the group felt it was awkward for him to be present, he would leave the meeting. He pointed out some other directors were in a similar position and more might be... in more might be in the future. Uh, in reply to a question, Dr. Simpson said you could see no reason for Dr. Aronstam to leave the meeting. Dr. Regman, so he's a representative of the Department of Health, I think, Professor, is that right, Dr. Regman? That, that's correct, yes. Um, uh, it's, he talks about cases of plaintiffs in the Wessex region being held back and would follow on after lead cases. Dr. Aronstam said he knew of at least two cases involving his patients which were going ahead as lead cases. It was news to him the Wessex cases were being put back. In view of the feelings already expressed, he thought he should leave the meeting for the time being while the matter was discussed. After Dr. Aronstam had left the room, the situation was discussed further. Several directors said they would feel nervous discussing details of their clinical practice with a representative of the plaintiffs in the room. Some suggested the health authorities' defence lawyers might be put in an embarrassing position. Professor Bloom thought that the health service solicitor's advice should be sought. Professor Preston thought the problem went beyond HIV and the discussion of liver disease in view of the Haemophilia Society's request for information might prove very awkward if an expert witness for the plaintiffs was present. We go over the page. Sorry, it's the next page. It was pointed out that Dr. Jones was acting for five plaintiffs in Scotland. After further discussion, it was agreed the chair would write for advice to the Consortium of Defence Lawyers and to the Central Legal Office in Scotland. Then there's a discussion about, in the next paragraph, about um, um, uh, the health authority's defence to the statement of claim. Discussion followed as to how the lawyers would put together a generic defence in the light of the varied practices at centres. Um, it was agreed that Barbara Simpson's letter was helpful. The chair would ask her to find further reports. And then uh, if we go to the bottom paragraph, Dr Lowe suggested that Dr Simpson's advice should be sought regarding the Haemophilia Society's request for information on hepatitis. Was hepatitis likely to be another item for which haemophiliacs would seek litigation? And was it advisable for the haemophilia centre directors to continue to collect data? Dr. Simpson said it would not be advisable, next page please, for the directors to stop collecting data as they'd already started to do so. Dr. Hill pointed out that hepatitis was not a new thing, only the test was new. After further discussion, Dr. Simpson agreed that the haemophilia society should not be given hepatitis data. And then there's an expression concern about Haemophilia Society representatives um, hearing hepatitis working party reports. Then the discussion we looked at earlier, which I don't need to go over again. Last paragraph on this page. Dr. Aronstam returned to the meeting, intimated in view of the obvious concerns of his colleagues, he would resign from the group. The chairman expressed his regret, asked Dr. Aronstam to consider the matter further before making a final decision. The chair would write to the defence lawyers to get their response to the situation and would let Dr Aronstam know the reply. Dr Lowe asked the chairman to take advice from the Central Legal Office in Scotland regarding Dr Peter Jones's involvement in the cases in Scotland. This was agreed. Um, and then, um, I don't think I need to ask to, uh, read the, the rest of um, um, the discussion which goes on to talk about other matters. Um, Dr Professor Lowe, first of all, wh why was... Um, uh, a representative of defence unions being invited to the AIDS group in the first place? Um, so clearly this is a, a major focus of the meeting is the impending litigation which was I think particularly going on in, in England um, and I assume that as part of that discussion uh, they would want uh, one of the defence union representatives, and I think at that time it happened to be Dr Simpson, uh, to reply to any questions that the directors uh, had. 
to what extent had the AIDS group established by Professor Forbes to discuss matters relating to the interests of patients become a meeting to coordinate a defence to the HIV litigation? Well, um, I had replaced Dr. Forbes at going to a script from about 1988, so only really had direct involvement from that time. Um, my memory is that this was unusual, because the usual um, discussions at the uh, AIDS group meeting, I think, were very much what you said at the start, you know, what information should we be collecting and what would be the general advice on UK HCDO about management uh, of AIDS. So this seemed, I, I was, I think, surprised that this was all about litigation. Uh, but anyway, I turned up and listened to the situation. So I don't know why the chairman would um, ask the lawyers to get, um, to get involved. But with regard to what's up on the screen at the moment, it seemed to me as, as a Scottish representative that this seemed to be mostly about events and uh, <laughs> difficulties going on in England. So, uh, and I thought that it would be appropriate uh, that if, if there was discussion with legal representatives as regards Scotland, there should be some communication with the Central Legal Office in Scotland, recognising that Scottish law, uh, as you know, is different from... Uh, uh, from English law. So I was really there as a, a slightly puzzled observer and thought that as a Scottish representative I should just make sure that the communications were were, were joined up between England and, and Scotland. If, if Dr. Arenstam and Dr. Jones had a different perspective to offer because they were, for example, providing advice to uh, expert reports for the purposes of, of litigation, would it not have been important for all haemophilia centre directors to understand that different perspective rather than simply coordinate a, um, a, a unified defendant response? Um, yes, uh, so I, I think a recurrent theme uh, of the UK HCDO was that they should be very active in involving all the haemophilia centres because all haemophilia centres uh, would be involved in litigation, whether it be for HIV or, or hepatitis. And, and I think that was part of the point I'm making here, is could we make sure that all the haemophilia centres, including the Scottish ones, uh, whose representatives didn't go to this meeting, I think it was uh, Dr. Ludlam from Edinburgh and my, myself or uh, Dr. Walker from, from Glasgow. Um, I, I thought that it would be appropriate to um, uh, for, for this committee to, to coordinate with all the haemophilia centres across the, across the UK. But why were you asking um, the chair, Dr Ritzer, to seek advice from the CLO regarding Dr Jones's involvement in Scottish cases? What, what, what had that got to do with the CLO? Or indeed with the AIDS group? Um, just, just for information, really, that these were the this was the uh, these were the legal actions going on. Um, I didn't know of any cases in Scotland being judged by Dr. Jones at that time. This was uh, news to me. I hadn't heard uh, about this. All, all I wanted to do was to make sure that the um, the Scottish haemophilia centre directors and the appropriate uh, legal uh, office which represents NHS in Scotland should be kept involved in these discussions. Can we go to the previous page, Shay Mick, bottom of the previous page? If we look at the last paragraph. Why were you seeking the advice of Dr Simpson, the Secretary of the Medical Defence Unions, on um, whether or not to provide information on hepatitis to the Haemophilia Society? Uh, 
I thought that uh, as he was there, as as he'd been invited to the meetings, um, I thought that uh, the AIDS group should be discussing uh, with their collective medical defense unions, of which I think Dr. Simpson was the representative at the time, um, um, his views on behalf of uh, the medical defense uh, societies. Um, I wasn't proposing um, any particular course of action. Um, I, I just wanted it discussed. Well, someone, and it may or may not have been you, um, the minutes read as though it's you, but the, the, the minutes may not be particularly clear in that respect, is posing the question about whether haemophilia centre directors should continue to collect data. So it, it appears as though what's being said is collecting data might lead to us being sued, therefore we shouldn't collect data. Is, is that the oh, view that that's would, there that, being expressed? That, that would certainly not be my view. I think it was very important that we should continue uh, to collect data on uh, every aspect. That was what we did routinely. And, um, you know, I, it was certainly not our centre's practice to stop collecting data. Why should we? You know, the main problem emerging at this time, as we've discussed, was <coughs> non a non b hepatitis and the emergence of hepatitis C uh, as a test. And uh, it was clearly very important that we should collect all the data that we could and give that uh, data and information to to our patients. Mm -hmm. I, I don't think uh, I don't think this was any anything um, I was advocating. I think you're quite right. Minutes are difficult. There are general discussions, and I don't recall saying ever suggesting that we should stop collecting data. And if we go to the top of the next page. That third and fourth line, that there is, however, um, uh, it would appear a, de a decision or an agreement by Dr. Simpson um, that data on hepatitis won't be given to the, uh, to the Haemophilia Society. Why was it decided that hepatitis data should not be sent to the Haemophilia Society? Well, it puzzles me because we were always very clear that all information on hepatitis in general and on their own results should be given to the patients. Um, I'm, I, I don't see, I'm not quite sure about the extent of involvement by the Haemophilia Society at that, uh, at that time. I don't know if this was an English phenomenon. Um, I mean, in, in Glasgow, we had very regular meetings with the local branch of the Haemophilia Society. And while obviously we couldn't give their representatives individual patient data, uh, we were very happy to say what our process was and that um, such data was being collected. And indeed, all this hepatitis data was uh, openly published at regular intervals by UK HCDO in their regular reports. You see, Professor, it could be said, and, and, and certainly patients reading this might think, that this comes across as doctors, the Haemophilia Centre directors, clubbing together to exclude those who might have a different view, Dr. Aronson, Query, Dr. Jones, with the Department of Health, Dr. Regman, to try and defeat patients' attempts to obtain compensation. Do you have any observation to make about that, Professor? Well, I, I, our policy was always to be very open. We told our patients what data we were collecting. We told them that it was being collated and discussed by UKHCDO uh, in the patient's interests. I, I can, um, I'm puzzled about this story about um, um, hepatitis data. I, I'm, I'm sorry, I have no further thoughts about that. Um. It, it, uh, it reads, um, Ms. Richards, as though uh, this was a, a group of people who regarded themselves as being uh, under attack in, in litigation. Can you just remind me who was the defendant in the action which was then ongoing as in respect of HIV? Primarily central government. That's what I thought. 
uh, and indeed one can see, if one go back to page three, please, Schumach. Um, that's, that's, thank you. Um, it, there was a specific question which makes it absolutely clear, I would have thought. Dr. Ian Simpson, who was the, um, the Scottish Medical uh, Defence Union representative, was it clear the medical staff would not be sued? That was quite clear. That's not plainly a reference to the current litigation. Uh, and uh, Professor Bloom asked if they could be sued at a later date, and of course that's uh, everyone's right to sue if they wish. Uh, and uh, that Dr. Simpson gives the appropriate reply. Can you help, uh, Professor? Did, um, did Dr. Simpson say, well, if you're asked to give your expert opinion, you, you must give it. Um, you should cooperate. And if it's your honest opinion, you should do so, and you shouldn't be excluded uh, from a group of others who appear, if they are excluding someone, possibly to be clubbing together in defence of not themselves, but the government. Well, I have to say, Sir Brian, I'm, I was quite mystified at this discussion. Um, I wasn't really aware at this time of the actions that were going on in England, and all of this was, was kind of news to me at the meeting, and I think I was really trying to seek clarification as to what was going on and what were the what were the uh, issues? I, w I would certainly not approve of any um, um, over defensive uh, uh, reactions. Uh, I think in our Scottish haemophilia directors meetings, of which I'm sure you have the notes, uh, we were always very clear that we should do what we can in Scottish centres to collate all the data across Scotland and discuss it and to communicate regularly to our patients in Scotland what was uh, what was going on at the Scottish Haemophilia Society meetings. So I think I'm, 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 I was puzzled at the time and I'm no clearer 30 years on as, as to what the uh, as to what the issues were. Thank you. Yes, uh, I should say of course also health authorities were defendants, some yes. health authorities defendants. Yes, well, that, 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 that I, I, um, I, I thought was the case but it, it uh, certainly uh, was, sorry, it wasn't the UK HCD, I'm sorry, it wasn't the UK HCD, no, was it? it was or, or individual doctors? No. Uh, could, I, could I just come back on that? So I think the situation was quite different in Scotland as it often is. So we didn't have health authorities. Uh, we had health boards in Scotland. Yes. And those were collectively represented by the central legal office and, uh, you know, the, the names on the tin. Uh, they coordinated all the... Uh, legal and defence issues across Scotland, and that was the reason uh, why at UK meetings I would just <laughs> religiously point out that Scottish law was different and the organisation of uh, the NHS and its uh, legal aspects was, was different in Scotland. Um, moving to a separate topic, um, Professor Lowe, um, you referred in your evidence on Wednesday to a paper from Dr. Mar oh, sorry, Professor Markova of the psychosocial benefits to child and adult patients of home treatment. Can I just check with you the paper to which you're referring? Could we have RLIT 40305, please, show Mick? So if we just look at the top half of the page, um, we can see it's um, a 1983 paper, the haemophilic patient self-perception of changes in health and lifestyle arising from self-treatment, uh, Professor Markova, Dr. Forbes, and others. Was that the paper to which you were referring, Professor? Yes, it is. We can see from the date it is 1983. Would you agree, therefore, Professor, that this isn't going to tell one anything about how patients might have viewed home treatment if they had known at the time, for example, of the risks of infection with AIDS. I agree. Okay, thank you. Um, can we then please... Yes, I don't think I need to put it back on screen, but you'll recall we spent some time yesterday, Professor, that, that can come down, show me. 
considering the letter of the 8th of January 1985, um, to which you and Dr. Forbes had appended your names and signatures. Um, did you consider at the time, or do you consider now, that putting your name to a letter when you couldn't verify its content or accuracy because you weren't at the time working at the Haemophilia Centre. Does that or did that, in your view, give rise to any ethical considerations? Well, as I think I made clear, this was Dr Forbes's letter and I was given very little time on a busy day to look at it. Um, I think Sister Campbell and I said, OK, if you want to send this out we're happy to look at it but we we had only i think about half an hour to to look at it i think um dr forbes was asking me as as a friend and a colleague he'd been supervising my studies in, in thrombosis uh, over many years he just wanted some help not really with a detailed critical analysis because as you say i had not been involved in the studies and the information I think he just wanted me to um, look at it and say, could I be added as a co-signatory, as a contact, in the case that patients sprang up and wanted to, to talk about it. I, I knew from our recent experience with that unfortunate aid patients, I, know, I knew something about AIDS, and I knew about the impending availability of, of routine tests, and I just offered in I've just offered to help. In retrospect, um, it, it may have been a mistake to sign that, but as I said, I think it was a draft that was going down for discussion at the AIDS Committee, and I'm really not sure if that letter was sent out in that format. In contrast, the April letter, uh, when I was uh, told that I was going to join a consultant and being involved in due course uh, with AIDS counselling and testing, I was happy to sign it as a kind of introduction that I would be becoming Dr. Forbes' co-consultant. Now, you told us about the, the, the model of, of um, how treatment was arranged in Glasgow in the sense of bleeding disorder patients being looked after, with certain exceptions, by physicians in the Department of Medicine, such as you and Dr. Forbes. We've heard elsewhere, more typically, a model of, of, of haematologists, some, not all of whom are from a... a, a an essentially pathological background. Why had Glasgow developed a different model from the model elsewhere? Is it just an accident of history or were there particular reasons for it? it I think as I tried to say in my outline of the history, uh, it very much started with Professor Douglas at a time when haematologists were physicians who were usually general physicians with an interest in haematology supported by a haematology laboratory. And then with the appearance of Dr. MacDonald in 1962, building up um, a department of haematology at the time when clinicians were now training both as physicians and as laboratory uh, haematologists uh, were developing. But um, the um, arrangements in Glasgow Island Infirmary was that these people all trained together uh, Dr. Forbes and Prentice stayed as physicians. Doctors Davidson and Walker joined um, the Department of Haematology, but they all knew each other and they all collaborated well, and that was a situation that, uh, that continued. And the particular advantage of our Department of Medicine was the involvement of rheumatologists, because that's the main problem uh, in haemophilia, and we always provided a very coordinated service um, uh, with our rheumatology colleagues, as I've described uh, re repeatedly. Um, so basically, when so Dr. Prentice moved off, uh, Dr. Forbes was then co-director with Dr. MacDonald, and when he moved to Dundee, I met with my haematology colleagues and say, well, you know, uh, do you still want me as uh, haemophilia consultants? And they said, yes, indeed we do because you've been very involved over the past year or two uh, with seeing the patients, counselling them about age and AIDS, and you and your rheumatology uh, co-consultants uh, have been extremely important in um, 
running the centre. The centre is based on the unit and the Department of Medicine. And they were entirely happy that I should continue and indeed to replace Dr. Forbes as a co-director because we then had a team that was three haematologists, Drs. McDonald, Davidson and Dr. Walker, uh, and myself and um, Dr. Sturrock in rheumatology. And within a short period of time, Dr. Maddock was appointed a consultant. And uh, so we had a, a service which provided comprehensive haemophilia care. I've taken care to point out to you that at no time did I or my predecessor physicians directly order blood products. That was all by law done by the haematologists, but we collaborated closely together um, and that seemed to work well. You told the inquiry over the last couple of days when talking about information provided to patients that as a result of the sign in the centre about hepatitis and, and the conversations um, um, that were had by or between patients, that hepatitis was, as you put it, the talk of the steamy. Would information, was information, of the nature spoken of by doctors Trigger, Underwood and Thomas at the 1980 symposium shared with patients? Yes, so as I said, uh just an hour or two ago, um, following that, well, Dr. Sturrock was actually at the, at the meeting, and he and Dr. Forbes immediately afterwards, as I understood it, said, right, this is emerging information on the uh, severity and the future problem of um, non-A, non-B hepatitis, and how can we collectively do something about it? So as I've just been saying earlier, uh, that was when Dr. Steeden, uh, started coming to the clinic, um, carefully examining the incidence and development of arthritis, and at the same time, collating all the information on liver function tests, etc., over the years. Now, as I said earlier, I was not present at these meetings, but at, at, at the clinical reviews, but these were regularly reported uh, at the unit research meetings. And all I can say is that I thought a lot of information was given to the, uh, uh, to the patients, but I wasn't there. Do, would you accept, as a matter of principle, um, that information of, of that nature was material to the patient's decision-making as to whether to accept treatment or not? Yes, and at these review clinics, I recall it was standard practice for... Dr. Forbes and Dr. Prentice to regularly discuss what treatment the patient was having and any implications for change, such as, for example, in 1983, some patients going back onto cryoprecipitate. Now, you've referred in the course of your evidence and you refer in your written statement a number of times to the collective response that was provided to the Penrose inquiry uh, in relation to the provision of information or availability of information about hepatitis. Now, I'm not asking you about the contents of that document, Professor, um, but, but about really its, its existence. Did it not occur to you that a collective response could lead to one person's recollection being influenced or distorted by others? Well, I think that as haemophilia directors in Scotland, we um, had very close relationships and we had regular meetings. I think that at the Scottish Executive Inquiry, and we've been discussing these letters from 2000, uh, we were asked um, collectively, um, could we gather together information as to over what period of time and in which haemophilia centres information about risk of hepatitis would be given. So we were directly asked by the Scottish office to assemble that uh, information. So that was what we did then. And then um, for the uh, Penrose inquiry, um, we discussed at the central legal office if it would be useful to follow that exercise and try and um, collate, um, uh, particularly from retired colleagues, what information they would have provided in, in previous years, because in particular, what the Penrose Inquiry was asking was before patients were first treated, you know, at that time, 
what would be said to patients or parents about hepatitis uh, risk. And for those of us who had only been working in haemophilia centres in recent years, we thought it was only fair to see if, if we could circulate um, previous directives saying, have, have you any, I mean, we couldn't all be called to the Penrose inquiry, um, have you any recollection of what would be given for the information of the, uh, uh, of, of the inquiry? Professor, isn't the fallacy of a collective response that it assumes that there was a universal practice that every centre did the same thing and thus obscures differences and variations between different centres and different clinicians? Well, I think Lord Penrose himself commented on this uh, at the inquiry, and uh, it, it'll be in the transcripts of the Penrose inquiry. He said he was a bit uncertain about this process uh, for the very reason that you, that you give. So he preferred to concentrate on the individual statements that were given by myself and other witnesses. And I can, I can understand that. I, I think, um, um, but I think it was a useful exercise just to, I mean, uh, just to collate the information if the inquiry wanted to accept that fine and if it didn't, fine. But we thought it's something that we'd been asked to do in repeated inquiries in 2000, in 2010 for Penrose, um, and now. But I accept that the, the inquiry may not want to accept it for the very reason that you give. Was the objective... Well, of I, I don't think we've, we've asked, we haven't uh, asked for, it. for that, have we? No, we haven't. I'm not sure Lord Penrose did, because he said it was inappropriate in his report to rely upon it for his understanding of what happened at the Glasgow Royal Infirmary, but that's Lord Penrose's different inquiry. We haven't asked for any collective response, so no. I mean, there's a, a world of difference between a, a collection of responses, each of which is individual, uh, and a collective response, which by definition is not. Yes. Yes, I'm, I'm sorry. Uh, you, you didn't ask for it, and I'm sorry you got it, but uh, that's You don't need to take it any further. I've, I've said what I've had to say. Um, j just picking up then on, again, some evidence you, you gave, I think, yesterday um, uh, or, or the day before about treatment and choice of products. Um, first of all, you, you told us, I think, that Dr. Davidson, when a new batch of factor concentrate arrived in the blood bank, would check it to see if the factor eight, which it contained, was what it advertised. How did he do that? Uh, he would make up a, a vial, as I understand it, and uh, check out that the number of units in the vial was what it said on the, on the label. And that, I think, from experience, was that there was variation, whether it be SNBT, S products, or commercial products. And he felt that it was part of his responsibility as director of the Blood Products Laboratory to run quality control. Uh, I was trying to find he, if he ever wrote this up as, as a paper, but I remember him giving it as, as, as a presentation uh, to the effect of the importance of quality control in a local blood products laboratory. Um, you talked again yesterday or the day before about, um, in the case of inhibitor patients who might need specific products, a joint decision being taken between you or Dr. Forbes or whoever the physician might have been and Dr. Davidson or, or, or um, uh, uh, um, uh, another in the blood bank um, as to what product to use. In relation to non-inhibitor patients, who presumably would have been the majority of patients requiring treatment, was the system that effectively the patient got what was on the shelf and what was on the shelf was, had been decided by Dr. Davidson? Uh, no, I think the, there were always um, uh, um, frequent discussions on the, what should the policy be of the haemophilia centre. As I said at the start, the haemophilia centre wasn't just um, the Ward 3 Department of Medicine centre that the severe patients came from. Uh, the haematologists, by tradition, continued to look after and regularly review many of, the, many of the milder patients, those who didn't have uh, joint disease, and were quite happy to continue coming to the uh, blood clinic run by Dr. McDonald, Dr. Davidson, and Dr. Walker, and remaining under their care. And that really only changed uh, when Dr. Walker joined me as, as co-director, and um, we decided that 
uh, we, sh we should try and unify the service, particularly because at that time we had the emerging problems of how to manage um, uh, AIDS, which the mild patients didn't have. But increasingly, it was discovered that some of these milder or moderate patients uh, had hepatitis, so it seemed entirely appropriate to bring them into the system uh, and have the contact with the hematologists. So um, there, were, there were always discussions about what treatments should be had. And my point is that it's only the hematologists who can prescribe and order products. It is not the physicians. But clearly, it's important that the physicians, Dr. Forbes and Prentice initially, and then myself, should be involved so that we could uh, have, uh, have input as well. But the decision by law had to be made by the, uh, by the haematologists. And sorry, if you just look at the minutes of the UK HCDO meetings, and indeed the uh, Scottish Haemophilia Directors meetings, which were started in the early 1980s and initially were chaired by, by Dr. MacDonald. Um, there, there was always discussion amongst all the haemophilia doctors in Scotland, whether they be haematologists or physicians, about the general policies of Scotland, which was important because SNBTS was the default supplier of products, and then to collectively share our experience. And when it came to the use of commercial uh, products, that again very much involved discussion at a Scottish level, hence the importance of these meetings. Because if, take the case of inhibitors, you have very expensive commercial concentrates. I mean, the cost of the porcine and the activated thrombin complex concentrates, that was an enormous cost. And it was important that general policies uh, be agreed at a Scottish level, because a small health board, like from Aberdeen, Dundee or Inverness, they couldn't afford to have uh, one expensive haemophilia inhibitor patient because they, they would, you know, um, have an enormous cost to a small health board with limited capacity. So it was very important to have a Scottish policy. And then I think from about 1988 through the Coagulation Factor Working Party, uh, for which you've had documentation from Professor Ludlam, who was the, the chairman of it, um, uh, that we had an arrangement whereby um, there was a coordinated policy on the, across Scotland on the purchase of commercial products. And that allowed us to spread the cost of these uh, products uh, across the whole of Scotland. Now, in your evidence yesterday, you referred to Dr. Forbes having been working on AIDS solidly for two years by late 1984. What work were you referring to? Um, his interest in, in the subject. Um, so the, the work, he, he was widely involved in discussions uh, with um, uh, H, UK HCDO uh, colleagues. His interest was evident that he was uh, the chairman of the uh, AIDS group uh, which we've just been talking about of UKHCDO, and he initiated the um, the Greater Glasgow uh, AIDS Information and Policy Group. So it really became his main interest from um, uh, 1983 in terms of getting information, uh, setting up uh, collaborations, um, in and uh, he was also, I think, in quite close touch with uh, American colleagues. He had been trained by Dr. Ratnoff in Cleveland, who kept in touch with them, um, and it was he kept in touch with his colleagues about the emergence of uh, information in the states. So it, it was, uh, I think, his main interest. G given all that, and given the research we looked at earlier, which resulted in that October 1983 publication, um, which recognised the possibility that the immune function results could be an an, 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 an an indicator of, of, of an early stage of, of AIDS. Why did it come as, as you reported in your evidence yesterday, a surprise or shock to Dr. Forbes that the test results he got back from Gallo in 1984 were positive? I, I think, as I said yesterday, my, my impression of his thoughts at the time was 
well, we had had to use some commercial uh, product at the Glasgow Royal Infirmary Centre. Um, firstly, for these inhibitor patients where there was no alternative, there's nothing made in Scotland or, or the UK that, uh, that could uh, treat these patients. And secondly, because uh, the efforts of SMBTS have mean that uh, we were pretty well self-sufficient in Scotland by 1980, 83. And I think that was the time when he thought, well, at least we're only using uh, the Scottish concentrate now, rarely have to use the uh, commercial. And I think he was hopeful that that might have solved the problem because uh, AIDS had not yet entered the Scottish donor pool. And I, uh, well, I'm sure you know what Professor Ludlam's response was when he got his results that all his patients who had been treated with SMBTS concentrates, uh, uh, a large number had become positive. I think it came as a great shock. Um, I want to ask you next about reporting hepatitis reactions. If you had a patient who had an acute hepatitis reaction to a factor concentrate, what was um, the process in terms of reporting that to the manufacturer, whether that be SMBTS or a pharmaceutical company? Was it reported and what information would be provided? So, um, firstly, it would, uh, well, if there was a clinical event, like a patient becomes jaundice, it was standard practice to investigate that case of jaundice in somebody who'd had a blood transfusion. Um, I can remember from the, the mid-1970s when I started, um, uh, Dr. McDonald marching across and saying, right, let's have all the information about the patient, let's have the test, we're going to check the products, and we must get back very rapidly to SMBTS as the manufacturer. And it was uh, important to um, contact the public health infectious diseases people for investigation. So, so that, would be, uh, that would be investigated. Uh, over what, but my question was about reporting to the, the manufacturer. Over what period of time, as far as you can recall, um, was it the practice of the Royal Infirmary to report a, an acute hepatitis reaction to the manufacturer? Was that always the position from 1975 onwards? Well, I, th I think before that. Um, I think... Um, <laughs> I, I put it at 1975 well, because that's when you arrived, Professor, rather than asking you to look back before your arrival. It was my understanding as a medical student that um, if somebody got jaundice and had had a recent blood transfusion or blood product transfusion, it was very important for that to be reported by whoever, general practitioner, hospital doctor, uh, to uh, the public health department. I mean, hepatitis B, at least, was a, a notifiable disease. It was a legal obligation and to report to the, well, within a hospital, um, it would be reported to the, the haematologist, the blood bank locally, and they would bring up the, um, um, well, if it was, say it was plasma cryoprecipitate, they would report it to the regional blood transfusion service um, in whichever part of Scotland it was. Uh, and then if it was a concentrate centrally prepared by the PFC, the Protein Fractionation Centre in um, in Edinburgh. So it was very important to rapidly report it for the very good reason that um, if, uh, if they could trace the donor, if it was single unit plasma or cryoprecipitate, or if it was a batch of concentrate, they would trace all the donors and try and work out what the source of the problem was. And do you know, again, whether at the Glasgow Royal Infirmary in the time that you were there, if there was a batch which was identified as having caused such a reaction in uh, a, a, a patient. Was there follow-up by the Royal Infirmary of other patients who'd received um, a batch implicated in, in possible hepatitis transmission? Yes, that would uh, routinely be done by the, um, uh, our haematology colleagues uh, in the blood and blood product laboratory and by SNBTS or the, the alternative uh, manufacturer that the whole there's there's a very um, in, rigid system about what had to be what had to be done. And did that system encompass telling the patient who'd received the batch, the patients who'd received the batch, or been given it for home treatment? 
Oh, absolutely. You'd have to say to the patient, um, you've probably got this through blood transfusion, um, and uh, we're telling you, and, well, if you have jaundice, you obviously have to treat any symptoms of the jaundice. Most of these patients from memory would be immediately transferred uh, to Rutgill Hospital or the appropriate infectious diseases ward, and there they would be informed about the risk of infecting other people. And during the uh, acute jaundice, there would be strict management of blood and body fluids, and then any sexual contacts uh, would be followed up and tested as well. There, it was uh, a standard procedure. Yeah, forgive me, my question was not sufficiently clear. Um, not, I wasn't talking about the patient who had the acute reaction, but other patients who had received the batch but not, or at least not yet, reported any reaction, would they be proactively contacted to ask them to bring the, the, the batch back in or, or to be told to look out for signs of jaundice or the like? Yes, that, that would be my understanding. That would be arranged by Dr Davidson and colleagues. Do you know whether it was routine for the Royal Infirmary to send details of clinical reactions to blood products and... And patients' ALT levels to to UKHCGO to Oxford. So, as I understand it, UKHCGO from the start of uh, its uh, database uh, in what 1970 or whatever routinely uh, collected information on jaundice, and that was uh, produced in the regular uh, reports. Um, if it was asymptomatic transaminase-itis, as we used to, to call it there, um, I think that took a bit longer before being systematically um, collected. Um, and I think it would be sometime during the 1970s, but, I, I, you know, that was before my time. I think for worry. dates, you'd want to ask UKHCDO. Do you know, again, if you don't, please say so, what reports were made of viral hepatitis as a notifiable disease to the Chief Administrative Medical Officer in respect of Glasgow Royal Infirmary bleeding disorder patients in, in the period from when you began there, 1975, to the early 90s? Uh, the Chief Medical Officer? Um, you would report it to the... Um, you would report it, well, through the process, as I've described, of uh, blood transfusion um, services. Um, and the notification of, um, uh, of hepatitis would be to the local public health department. Yes, so and the chief administrative... The chief officer. medical officer, yes. I think. Yeah. Yeah, to the chief administrative medical officer of the local area health board, I think that was the requirement, but that doesn't matter, I think. The, the, the question is, do you know how many reports were made of viral hepatitis from 1975 onwards in respect of um, Royal Infirmary bleeding disorder patients? Oh, I, I couldn't tell you the number because, uh, as you know, I wasn't regularly involved in um, clinic reviews or anything until I became a consultant. I... I um, I uh, asked you yesterday or the day before about record-keeping systems. Do you know whether records were held separately from the, the, the type of records you've described under the name of research, so research records relating to patients? Uh, no, I, I think they were all in this. Every patient had a folder within the filing cabinets, and then that we tried, as I said, to always keep the patient's entire case records if possible, but um, as a fail-safe, because those would go off to surgeons or other things from time to time, and we always asked for those to be returned. We had a kind of file of the basic details of the patients, so we knew exactly um, who they were, what they had, and what to treat them with as, as they attended as emergencies. The position with um, research was that um, any uh, relevant uh, consent forms or <coughs> information sheets would be put into the <coughs> that file, as far as I know. Um, <coughs> for um, um, there were there would also be files for uh, keeping track of um, 
studies, uh, and the ones I recall are when um, all the haemophilia centres in Scotland were doing um, trials of clinical efficacy and safety of the high purity S and BTS products in the 1990s. Um, each centre would keep a, a file of the patients enrolled into these studies as a study file, if you see what I mean. Uh, so that could be reviewed. SNBTS wanted to collate the, the numbers and things uh, from these uh, from these trials, and those would be kept in a study file as well as in the individual patient files. That was my memory. So if you had, for example, by reference to some of the research that we looked at earlier this afternoon, Professor, the studies by Dr. Froebel or the rheumatology study or the immune function study, um, the data that was collected in relation to individual patients that was being analysed for the purposes of those studies, might there be separate files, call them research, call them study files, wh whatever you will, but separate p patient data, patient identifying data held separately from the core patient records um, in the haemophilia centre? So, for example, the um, laboratory studies, so are you talking about the T-cell subsets, that kind of... Um, well, any of uh, the studies that we've looked at. Um, the, uh, there would be a file of the collated uh, results for uh, analysis, patient number one, patient number two, etc. Uh, the study investigator would obviously keep a um, a file of the results for, uh, for analysis for the period of the study. So does that mean there might exist in the Royal Infirmary or indeed in Rock Hill or wherever the study was being conducted, um, sp specific test results, for example, relating to individual patients that, that, that exists outside of the haemophilia centre records? Well, after the study, I think the rule was that the investigator would keep uh, the, the file of the study results for a period of time, uh, certainly up until publication. And then I think it was good laboratory practice to, to hang on to those files for a period of time. But eventually, um, um, that the results of these studies um, would be destroyed as with any other documentation. Did you, in December 1975, see the World in Action documentary? That, that, I'm sure you know which documentary I'm referring to. Uh, no, I didn't, because I didn't have a television at the time. But <laughs> um, um, it was in the newspapers, obviously. There is some publicity about it. And um, uh, I think it was referred to... To, sorry, what was the date of that? December uh, 1975, I think. I hope I've got that right. Yes, eighth, yeah. I think 8th of December. 8th of December 1975, thank you, sir. Um, 75. So I, I think, as I said, uh, you got the programme of that symposium I attended at the Glasgow College, but that was maybe That was September. September. That was uh, September, right, yeah. Uh, so it wouldn't be mentioned then. No, I think I read about it in the newspapers, and um, obviously it was uh, discussed, um, you know, just on the unit, oh, what about these commercial blood products? And I remember Dr. Forbes and Dr. Prentice saying, oh, yes, we... Well, in fact, Dr. Forbes, I think, was asked this at the Penrose Inquiry, and he said, yes, I thought it was shocking. And um, I seem to recall him saying that, oh, well, um, better make sure that any um, commercial products that are ordered by the haematologists uh, are, are not that kind of product or words to that effect. So, so there was talk about it. Yeah. Um, and then can I ask you, with the, nearly there, Professor, can I ask you about um, something in your statement? If we go, please, WITN 34690113. We go to page 48. We look at the top paragraph, paragraph 16.2. You talk there about the combination of 
DDAVP and the response to injury, which raises levels of factor VIII for Willebrand factor, often allows us to not have to give blood products. And um, I just wanted to ask you about um, what you say there about the response to injury. How does the response to injury work, and does it work in a similar way to the, to the desmopressin itself? Uh, it's independent of the uh, desmopressin. So the response to injury phenomenon was described in Glasgow and Fermi in the 1930s. It's a metabolic response, but uh, one of the components of the metabolic response is that the endothelial cells, which line blood vessels, um, uh, respond by raising levels of von Willebrand factor, which is an endothelial product, and that's the carrier protein uh, for factor VIII. And that whole complex of both of these uh, things uh, goes in, rises in the blood uh, by somewhere between 50% and up to 300%. It's highly variable according to the individual and according to the level of injury. So the point is that if you have um, somebody with mild hemophilia, um, then um, if they say ha have a 10% level of factor VIII or von Willebrand factor, um, their response to injury could put that up to um, between 15 and 30, um, but highly variable. So it was important if you had somebody with mild hemophilia and say um, uh, an injury to, uh, to get a baseline level and then uh, give the injection of desmopressin and then assay the pre and post desmopressin levels. Um, you could find, not always, that the combination of injury and desmopressin actually allowed the patient to have um, a, a reasonably hemostatic level uh, and allow us not to have to give blood products. So the point I'm making is that if you have a patient without injury, desmopressin is, is, doesn't give you that double benefit. But um, if you have a response to injury, that might help, and that might allow you to carry on with desmopressin rather than to have to use a blood product. And does that response to injury, as you described it in your statement, rely upon the patient being conscious or aware of the injury, or is it the body's own um, response, as it were? No, it's the body's own response. And then um, if we go on to, uh, no, we go back to, I think it's page 14 of your statement. Paragraph 8.4.9, you describe here the use of tranexamic acid. Um, uh, and if we look at the top of the next page, you go on to talk about how tranexamic acid was shown to be effective in minimizing blood loss and hence minimizing blood and blood product use after dental extraction and other types of minor surgery in patients with mild or moderate um, hemophilia. Um, um, would the, um, so this is a, number, a series of questions I've been asked to ask of you, Professor, by interested core participants. Would the infusion of tranexamic acid with a clotting factor product, whether that's fresh frozen plasma, cryoprecipitate, or concentrate, reduce the amount of clotting factor product required? Um, the more important thing is that tranexamic acid, which was usually given orally, uh, so you could give it before the dental extraction, you, it didn't have to be um, infused. Uh, that was shown in these randomized trials by Dr. Forbes and colleagues in Glasgow, but also in other studies in Oxford and London. Those are the two big trials that were done at this time. Um, that, I mean, tooth extraction was great because you could see exactly if it was working or not. So the patient would be kept in hospital, monitored, and the, if, if you read these papers, it say that uh, the procedure was to give tranexamic acid, watch the patient, uh, and often, often it worked. So the standard practice would be to give a five to seven day course, and then just watch the patient initially, and then discharge them and say, come back if you get any bleeding. And in fact, the study by Dr. Forbes had very uh, careful uh, documentation of the quantitation of bleeding. So it, it, it had a very dramatic effect in these minor patients 
but in many patients you didn't have to give any blood or blood uh, product use and by implication you reduce hepatitis risk. Um, for a patient in respect of whom you've judged that you can't just rely on tranexamic acid, would the combination of tranexamic acid and a, a clotting factor product potentially either enhance the, the effect of the clotting factor product or allow you to use less of it? Well, um, what we used to do in patients with mild haemophilia von Willebrand's disease was to give both tranexamic acid and desmopressin. So you're giving two synthetic drugs and you crossed your fingers and hoped that that would allow you not to have to use the blood uh, product. Um, but was it ever used in combination with blood products, I think is the question I've, I'm, I've, I've been asked to oh, explore with I, you. I'm sorry. Yes, it would make sense, because you're quite right. Um, you would hope that the blood product uh, required, the dose of it, uh, would be less than if you didn't give tranexamic acid. Okay. Um, last question I, I have, Professor, is, is this. Um, what lessons... Do you think have been learned by you and your colleagues at the Glasgow Royal Infirmary as a result of the infections and in, indeed in many cases deaths of patients treated there um, in the 70s and 80s? Well, looking back, as I think many of us does, um, it was a tragic emergence of transfusion transmitted infections. It, it, was, it must have been heartbreaking for my colleagues, my predecessors, uh, Dr. Forbes, Dr. Prentice, etc., uh, to see it uh, emerging. Um, I and Dr. Walker from you know, late 80s, 90s, um, were in the position that we ourselves never prescribed these products. Um, but nonetheless, Anybody in our situation watching first the HIV epidemic, but then the double whammy uh, was um, hepatitis. And that was very tragic because these are patients who've suffered with um, the, the risk of AIDS. And then they think, well, at least I haven't got that. And then you've got hepatitis and this slow burn virus which has been there for years but you know it's now becoming clinically evident and that that was heartbreaking that was heartbreaking to watch we we tried our best <clears throat> by building up a, a team of the hepatologists the id colleagues our nurses social workers psychologists we made every effort to provide safer treatment and I think in Scotland we succeeded in providing virus safe treatment quite quickly. But it is it was very sad to watch. And we recognise that across the whole United Kingdom, many patients and their families have questions about their treatments. And I think I and my colleagues hope your inquiry will answer them, and we wish the inquiry well. well professor, thank you. Those are my questions, sir. Do you have questions for Professor? Uh, uh, just, just a, a couple of short questions arising out of some of this afternoon's exchanges. Um, f first, uh, you can educate me a bit. Um, talking about the, uh, the injury response and desmopressin, my, my understanding... Uh, is that desmopressin works in effect by uh, multiplying the effect of whatever factor eight there may be uh, in the bloodstream by a, a two, two to four times uh, the, the amount. Um, the injury response, that presumably also liberates the factor eight protein which is already there, does it, in some respects? Or how, how does that... Uh, what I, the question is this: Do the the two, that's desmopressin and the injury response, are they multiplicative in effect, or are they additive? It's it's a very good question. 
Um, and as a clinical scientist, I often think, you know, how I would have tried to do that. Uh, I think probably I would have addressed that question had we had it earlier by measuring a very sensitive measure of the acute phase reaction uh, called C-reactive protein. And our laboratory became very interested in that and its evaluation as a risk predictor of thrombosis and that kind of thing. And uh, the experiment that, uh, well, not that the study, uh, should I say, that should have been done is every patient who came in with mild hemophilia and an injury it would have been very instructive uh, to measure serial C-reactive protein levels and correlate that with the extent of the factor eight response. And then on top of that, to try and uh, measure the effect of the desmopressin response. And that would give some quantitative answer to your, to your, to your question. I don't know, but there's no doubt they had an additive effect. Thank you. Uh, the, the second question isn't, isn't a, a question really of, of, of just borrowing from your expert knowledge for a moment. Uh, it's, um, it's about the question of, of the testing which was done. Um, you, you mentioned uh, that uh, Dr. Forbes may have been surprised uh, when he got the results back uh, in October, September. Uh, of uh, 1984. Two questions arise uh, out of that. Um, would you have expected the, um, the study which was reported by, which you told us about this morning, uh, reported in the BMJ in, in uh, I think it was August 1983, um, dealing with T-cell levels and ratios, that might have alerted someone, I suppose, to the possibility that patients treated with Scottish concentrate or commercial concentrate, in either case, might be on their way to getting AIDS. Uh, I think that's right, Sir Brian. Um, yes, and it, it's been a it, it's been a recurring. Theme, you know, what was AIDS due to? Um, the discussion of both the Froebel paper in Glasgow uh, and Professor Ludlam's parallel uh, experience in Edinburgh was, uh, what are the possibilities? Um, and the, I was very interested actually in Professor Ludlam's comment last week because I hadn't thought about this before. And he said, I think I've only just realized that the uh, probably the main cause of these low um, the, these abnormalities in T lymphocytes. Uh, and you mentioned earlier this uh, paper that Dr. Maddock did saying the HIV negative patients also had this phenomenon. So it wasn't HIV. What was it due to? And I think Dr. Ludlam probably told you the answer last week. He said, I've only just realized that uh, the factor nine patients who got a completely different preparation of concentrate, which did not have immunoglobulin levels, uh, they never had these abnormalities. It was only the factor eight patients, and it's probably the immunoglobulin content of the concentrate, which was quite high, uh, which uh, which was responsible. So it may take 30 years to work out the answers to these questions, but I think that was probably it. Um, I would ask the question, suppose it had been the other way around? Suppose it was the factor IX concentrates in the minority of patients who had haemophilia B who had all the abnormalities and the factor VIII preparations for whatever reason had no immunoglobulins, we would have never seen these abnormalities. It's, it's one of these questions with the retrospective so to say, well, we didn't know the answer then, and it may have taken us 30 years to realize the answer, the answer now. I think the point I'm making is that suppose we had very pure concentrates um, in those times, which we didn't, we wouldn't have seen these um, changes in lymphocyte count, and maybe we would have realized that it was definitely a virus even before HDLV3 was discovered. Um, I'll come back to that in, in, in a moment. 
but the thing which has been puzzling me a bit is this. If, um, if a test is done, a sample is sent off for a test, uh, you might expect a result back. And you might know what result you'd like to see, but the whole point of the test is finding out what, res what the result is, isn't it? I mean, it, that, 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 that must, must be logical, otherwise why would you test if you already know the answer? Well, you're testing to see what in UK patients with haemophilia, uh, what changes you might see I, 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 I'm, sorry, we're, we're, we're across, I'm sorry for stopping you. I, I don't mean to be, be rude and cut across you, please. But it, it's just, uh, I'm thinking now of the, what's puzzled me a little bit uh, about the reaction of, of Dr. Forbes, because you've described how when he got the test back, he, he, he spent quite some time really thinking about how on earth to manage uh, the consequences of the results which had come through. Uh, and you've told me how he had to formulate the, uh, the, the involvement of uh, counselling uh, and uh, draft a letter and, and so on. Uh, and if um, he'd sent off samples for a test, what's been puzzling me is why he didn't expect that they might come back with uh, a result which showed that some were positive and he'd have to deal with that and prepared for it in advance. Uh, and the point about asking about the 1983 study was that that might have given him all the more cause for thinking, well, there might just be something going on here, because at that stage he, he wouldn't have uh, uh, given the explanation which uh, Professor Ludlam gave me last, uh, last week or so, because he wouldn't have known it. Um, he would just have seen a, 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 an amber light, if not a red one, warning him that there might be something up. So I, I, I've been wondering, did he, did he not contemplate beforehand what he might do if the results came back as, as they did, or something like it? Did, you can help me with that. Did he ever mention to you, or were you aware that he might have been thinking before the results came back as to what to do if they did show a problem? Right, um, so can I be clear, Sir Brown? You're talking about 1983 and the results of I'm the changes. I'm talking about 84, uh, the tests coming back showing there are positive uh, HIV infections, seropositivity in a number of patients. The right. question is really the, the samples are sent off um, from stored sera uh, to, uh, to the laboratory, Gallo's laboratory. They come back. Uh, there is shock and horror uh, because uh, th they're positive. The question really is, why didn't you, why didn't, not you personally, but why wasn't it anticipated uh, that that might happen? Because that's the whole point of testing. And all the more so, this is where 1983 comes in, all the more so because there might have been a red flag flying or a warning um, amber light, well, how well one describes it, uh, from the year before, given the results in, of the T-cell study in, in August. So the question for you with that introduction is, did Dr. Forbes give you any indication that he had, in advance of the results coming back, thought about what he might do if they were positive? Well, I, d I don't know, Sir Brian, because, you know, I... Um, in well, that I mean, period can, can, can you remember any, uh, anything that he said which might oh. indicate that he had thought about it? Uh, no, I didn't. So, I, as you know, I was working on another unit. I was on my summer holidays, so I knew a bit about AIDS in general. But the first I heard about uh, Dr. Forbes getting the results was him saying, right, we've got some results back, and can you come and meet with Dr. Melby and discuss uh, the paper that we're going to put, uh, to put together? So during that time when he said, right, I think we should send the samples off. I, I had no interaction with Dr. Forbes. I didn't know what was being done, so I can't tell you uh, what he was thinking at that time. All I know was he said, um, it's, it's, it's bad news. We've got these results, and I'm trying to struggle what to do with them. And we just dis discussed at length yesterday uh, the, the ethical problems that he faced, uh, particularly um, 
I mean, I was there when Dr. Froebel said, you do know that this is not a test that you can provide reliable clinical information. And I think I saw uh, a moment when he thought, oh my God, you know, I've got the information, but Dr. Follett tells me that there's no way as a local clinical virologist, he could defend a clinician giving an unreliable result, a false positive or a false negative. And he said, what we all have to do is to get a reliable test, but meantime, go ahead and you know say that we've done the study uh, there is this public health aspect as we, we have to, you know, change the non-heat treated concentrate ASAP to prevent any further things. And that was the important thing. And you have to communicate that there is a risk now for patients in Scotland and advise them about precautions with blood, sexual partners. That, that, you know, that, that's the public health imperative that said yesterday. That, that was very clear. The difficulty then, which I think Dr. Forbes addressed very quickly, was to encourage Dr. Follett to get a reliable test as soon as possible, as everybody does. It wasn't just Glasgow. As I said, Dr. Tedder um, at this AIDS meeting in, in February, you read the minutes, he says, well, my test's not very good either. And he was concerned. Dr. Krask was concerned. They said, these are not tests that are reliable. And that was a bit of a problem. So when people say... Um, as the newspapers do in this inquiry and did, uh, patients should have been told immediately, well, that's difficult um, when you have a situation where a reliable test is, is still coming along. You, you can give the general message, but it would be devastating to be told, it's okay, you're HIV negative, and then a few weeks or months later to be told, I'm sorry, it's positive, or vice versa. I mean, there are consequences to that. So I think that in diagnostics, the clinician has to be very aware of the limitations of a test. And the, I, I think that also gave Dr. Forbes the window of getting an experienced counsellor in our centre to intensively uh, focus upon speaking to the patients about AIDS tests and particularly focusing on those patients that Dr. Forbes knew to be positive because he wanted to start addressing the subject with them, uh, pre preparing them to think about the test and then getting the fresh samples done for the uh, validated uh, response. So I think I can hear what you're saying, Sir Brian, but I think the correct ethical decision that Dr. Forbes made was not to instantly ring up the patient and say a research test is positive, but it might not be positive. I don't think that would have been appropriate medical practice. Thank you very much. Uh, that's all I ask, Ms. Richards. So I should have said Mr. Barry, who represents Professor Lowe, um, has indicated to me that he doesn't have any questions for him. Um, Professor Lowe, is there anything that you wanted to add? Um, no, nothing to what I've said already. Thank you. So, so that concludes for today. Um, in terms of the timetable for when we resume, I can indicate what the first week is going to be. Well, f first, let, let me, let oh, of me, course. I'm let so me sorry, just say, say something to uh, Professor Lowe, uh, because you, you deserve our, our, our thanks. We've, we've invaded your, your home. Uh, you, you've given us, uh, in your, uh, if I may describe it, um, your, your, your chatty way with um, illustrated or uh, enlivened, perhaps, with anecdotes from your, uh, your personal uh, history uh, and those around you. Um, a, a, an insight into uh, what ha happened during your time in, in Glasgow and your best uh, efforts to to tell us what you may have picked up uh, at times when you weren't really uh, concerned with, with haemophilia care. And you've given us a, a huge amount of, of detail. Uh, you're enthusiastic, I think, for, for detail, such when you can remember it. Um, so I'm... Uh, I'm Thank you for that and for allowing us to come into your home um, and take your evidence from, from there. Um, it's been three days, uh, three half days perhaps, a bit more than half days possibly, but thank you. Thank you, Sir Brian. Um, so so uh, in terms of when we resume in January, because that today concludes the hearings for, for 2020, um, we resume on the 12th of January when we will hear evidence from Dr. David Bevan. 
that's the Tuesday of that week. On the Wednesday, the 13th of January, there will be a presentation um, by me in relation to the Manchester Haemophilia Centre. And on the 14th, the Thursday, we will hear from Dr Janet Shirley. We had previously scheduled for that week um, a presentation and possibly evidence about uh, haemophilia treatment and care in Northern Ireland. That will now be in the week of the 29th of March 2021, when there will be a presentation on the Belfast Haemophilia Centre. Uh, there will be evidence called from Dr Gary Benson. Um, it, it's possible that there may be further evidence. Um, we're still making some in, in, in inquiries in that regard. In relation to the timetable time in between, there are still some... Well, I'll I, I, I yes. say something about that Precisely. in a moment. Yes, they'll, they'll be published on the website in due course. Thank you very much. Uh, uh, well, this has been the, the last day of hearings for this year. And like so much in the New Year period, it's a chance both to look back and to look forward. It's now two and a half years since the inquiry began. It would have been great if I had been in a position to present its report before 2021 begins. Not a week goes past without my remembering that speed is important. But I promised also to be reasonably thorough. And I would hope that whatever your perspective on the inquiry, you can see for yourselves that the inquiry has been and is being just that. Without the time taken in preparation and the evidence given in writing and orally, often deeply moving, often troubling, always valuable, the inquiry would not have been able to ask the questions Miss Richards and her team so searchingly have done over the past three months. The evidence of one clinician is not always easy to reconcile with that of another, or the documents, or the evidence of those infected and affected. Well, like all of us, they're people. They have different ways of looking at what happened and different abilities to address it when recalling the past. But overall, a broad picture of what happened and why is slowly beginning to emerge for me, and a foundation for concluding what might have been done is gradually being laid. Well, thank you for your patience so far through the current pandemic. Many of you will have wanted to see witnesses give their evidence in person rather than on a big screen, and I have little doubt that many of you would have welcomed the collective comfort of meeting in Fleet Bank to hear that evidence. And witnesses, too, have said they would rather be here in person. You know I would have preferred it. But we've done what we could so far as the restrictions have allowed it. Well, so much for looking back. What about the future? Well, I hope that from January it will be possible to hear more evidence in person. Indeed, you'll see that the timetable, some of which Miss Richards has outlined, envisages this. Obviously, we may have to adapt for the whim of the virus. That evidence will continue to come from haemophilia doctors. And then, towards the end of January, we'll hear from the expert group on medical ethics. They may have had something to reflect on. In February and in March, we shall take evidence on the Haemophilia Society and trusts and schemes. In late March, on Trelaw's school, and as you've just heard, in the Belfast Haemophilia Centre. The council team will also give a presentation on the smaller haemophilia centres. After Easter, we plan to take evidence from campaigners and then government witnesses, including ministers and civil servants, those who had responsibility for decisions taken at the time within government, who can best shed a light on the events this inquiry is charged with investigating. Looking further ahead, still, to the autumn. Then we'll be scrutinising the evidence about the blood services and pharmaceutical suppliers. Infections transmitted by blood transfusions will come to the fore in many of those hearings. But as always, the hearings are just the visible tip of the inquiry's work. The great bulk of the work continues until the hearings begin again in January, even while this inquiry room stands empty. 
uh, though I'm, you will, I'm sure, understand that there are one or two days or so during the Christmas period when uh, no one is likely to be at work. Just to emphasize the sheer scale of the investigation, more than 14 million pages have been reviewed for potential relevance. This material has come from over 600 document providers, including international, archives, trusts, haemophilia centers, and government bodies, as well as from individuals. The documents stretch back to the 1920s. There is more yet to come. But throughout, be assured, I am conscious of the passing of time. Well, finally, let me turn from past and future to present. Christmas is an enjoyable time of the year for many, but it could be a very difficult time for those who've lost loved ones or are struggling with the difficulties of infection. Especially in this particularly challenging year, which has more than most brought the realities of infections home to people. I hope that whoever you are, you're able to make the best of this holiday season. I'm sure you wish you'll join me in wishing all involved in this inquiry, in whatever way, a better 2021. Thank you.